On today's episode, I sit down with Joan Rosal. Joan is the COO of Multiply Meat. It's a very different episode, or maybe not a very different episode, but it's an episode where her and I actually talked about the growth of Multiply Me from, you know, the planning and building stages all the way through to having 140 people on payroll. So we really dive deep into the things that I believe we do differently um, from the perspective of a COO of the business. I think one of the most integral roles that you'll find. Um, the first time we've ever had this conversation and we did it uh, recorded. So it's, uh, it's an interesting one. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was fun to reminisce, but I think really, and most importantly, going through this and hearing what it was like to grow a business over the last two years and the different stages and, and how to approach aspects of it around process systems, uh, data, information, team leadership, onboarding, management. I mean, it's really jam packed. So while it's not an external person, I think it's probably one of the most valuable episodes. And like I say on most episodes, I hope you get a lot of value out of it because it's been a really fun journey today. And I'm excited to see where we take things into the future. Joan, welcome to an episode of Successful Scales. I am so excited to be sitting down and having this conversation with you. Oh, well, the pleasure is all mine, Yanni. Um, you know, you, you've had the podcast since February. And uh, for us, like, I'm a fan and a follower, along with everyone in the company, including my family. <laughs> and so it's, uh, yeah, but it's an honor to, to be a guest here. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if you're not following and promoting, then obviously there's no more working together. So, <laughs> no, I, I can't believe you sit through it, but uh, obviously, I always appreciate the support. So, obviously, you and I know each other better than any guests I've ever had on the podcast to date. And so, obviously, for me, you need no introduction and I don't have to go through the usual spiel. But the reality is, people outside of you and me and the companies that we've built, don't know who you are. So I'd love you to, to take everyone through sort of who you are, a bit about your background. And I'm telling you now, I'll be filling in lots of the gaps because I know that you're not <laughs> going to promote yourself as well as you should and how impressive you are. I'll try my best, Yanni, to make you proud. <laughs> Here goes. <laughs> but yeah, so before uh, joining Multiply Me, I've actually worn several hats over the years, which I think um, has helped me prepare to handle the challenges of serving as a CEO for a startup company like ours. Um, and so I have a decade of experience working in a um, variety of managerial roles. So I've run operations um, ranging from like startups to businesses to enterprise businesses. I've uh, done project management work, digital marketing, and business consulting. So um, like that's a mix of uh, operations, workforce management, organizational development, and strategic planning. But bulk of my experience was actually in the digital ad purchasing space where I worked for two Google vendors in the past. Um, I also worked with and for creative agencies and e-commerce companies. Um, when I did project management, it was for um, websites and app development projects, Salesforce implementation projects, um, and digital marketing campaigns. And then when I worked as a business consultant, I've helped with service model development, business restructuring, business planning, setup, and even acquisitions. And then I met you guys. Yeah. Do you know it what? It all changed. <laughs> Do you know what, Joan? I got to say, for the first time in the probably three years now that we've known each other, you've done, I'd say you're almost there at really presenting yourself <laughs> at a level that you, you deserve. So, I mean, super impressive background. And, you know, hearing you actually outline what it is you've done over the years. I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense in, in so many different areas. I mean, you know, I speak about it a lot on other podcasts and people that I speak with. My background also is very much in the digital and creative advertising space. And I think that's you, where you and I really saw eye to eye. And I think it's like one of the proving grounds as well. There's not going to be many places where they work you harder. There's a high level of stress and, you know, a, a, an amount of pressure when you talk about service-based industries. And then you talk about mm -hmm. particularly creative advertising, digital marketing, yeah. huge demand, different beasts. 
different, absolutely different beast um, and different expectations. And especially when you're working with enterprise clients, you know, there's this level of expectation that's both placed on you and a level that you want to live up to. So yeah. I think that's why you and I get along so well. We have sort of deep understandings of what we've been through and, and what's led us on this journey. But I'd say, you know, coming from very different aspects of it, like I was always the sales and marketing digital strategy type, whereas, you know, you're literally building structures for businesses, service delivery models, you're effectively running what I would argue is some of the most complex, um, some of the most complex service delivery models that exist. And, and the reason why I say that not to discredit any other service models is when you, when you think about the landscape of creative advertising, you're looking at things like designers, developers, mm -hmm. content writers, uh, videographers, photographers, PPC managers. I mean, the, you know, and I'm just throwing a few out there, but when you look at the different types of people that exist in an operation like that, you know, it's not like, it's not like a, an accounting firm, let's say, where, you know, maybe you've got people who are in client services potentially, but the reality is it's a lot more one dimensional in the type of person, you know, very much aligned with numbers focused, very sort of mm -hmm. output driven, you know, when you've got a creative, you know, a creative director trying to interact with a senior technical developer that's mixed in with, you know, a social media content producer, you know, those, those meetings become very interesting and super hard operations to, to manage. So again, why, I gravitated so much toward you and I think vice versa. And, you know, a lot of the reason why we are sitting here today. Um, so, I mean, I could keep diving into your, to your background, but I think this episode, like I was saying to you before, I want to run it a little differently. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not looking at the typical speaking to an industry expert and going through that specific output of how they've approached scaling businesses I mean, for the first time, I'm sitting down with someone where you and I have been on this journey together and we've gone through a whole series of evolution. And, yeah. you know, for anyone listening in, John and I haven't had this level of conversation about sort of the growth and the experience and what it's been mm. like and all these things. So this is totally uncut, unfiltered and a first that John and I are speaking about it. But I mean, from your perspective and also to give everyone a little bit of context before I hand it over to you. Um, when Joan and I started working together, so one of the one, there you of, go. <laughs> yeah, one of the aspects that we uh, we haven't touched on yet, Joan and I were working in the Amazon business that we yeah. helped scale from two to five million dollars in twelve months. And when she came on board, I distinctly remember interviewing her. And one of my first comments to Joan was like you're way too <laughs> overqualified for a project management role in, you know, effectively a creative agency. And Joan was like, I'm happy with that. You know, it's all, it's all good. That's, that's what I'm looking to do. It was the first time that you'd stepped into like the BPO industry, not working sort of corporate. And so when I got down to it, it was like the level of stress involved in running a, such a complex operation and just Joan didn't really have the interest to it. And here we find ourselves like three years on and she's the CEO of the company. <laughs> she's, she's running operations. And, you know, it's one of those things that it looks like has, uh, you know, you were, you were born to, to be in that position. So uh, I'm very appreciative that you've taken it on. And, you know, I know hearing from you that it's definitely different this time in how yeah. you and I operate. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been sort of the, the draw card, but back to the point of the story. So, Joan, Joan's been here from, from day zero. Um, when I was pitching Joan and Lippy and Jason, I came with a business model canvas where it literally outlined like what, what it was that we were going to create as a solution. And, you know, I really worked to get Joan's buy-in uh, and, and Lippy's buy-in and Jason's buy-in to see, you know, if they'd come on this journey with me. And, and here we are. So, I mean, from your perspective, you know, the early days of multiply yeah. mean it's it's first iteration like walk us through what that was like in in the early stages of planning for people who were going down this path and trying to think about starting a business what was that like so yeah like although like th that that was my background right it's so different altogether because uh for the first time i was with kindred spirits 
and we were all in sync. It's scary <laughs> to think about it. So that's why we, we're here where we are now. Like it's what we've only been in the market for about a year and four months. Um, but we've already grown from like starting with four um, of the founding members to now about 130 employees servicing about 60 clients. Like you said, like during that inception stage back in November 2019, all we had was that that um, business, uh, what do you call it? the business canvas, and then we just we ran with it as soon as we had that. And what we did was with that business model canvas, the four of us divided and conquered. So like I mapped out the task assignments, deliverables, and deadlines, like wearing uh, my project manage, manager hat, but everyone followed uh, the timeline perfectly. Yoni, of course, was in charge of the sales and marketing uh, strategy, Libby on finance and pricing, um, Jason on HR, and I did the SOPs and processes for the operations. We, it involved um, tons of research, case studies. We checked a lot of references that would fit who we wanted to be and what we wanted to do and what we wanted to prove. So that includes, included testing out an assortment of tools. And finally, we actually even set it up ourselves. Um, and it, since we were so disciplined and we were so like passionate, um, it only took us about two to three months to do all the strategy component, the planning, uh, the mapping out, and even the setup of the, the systems. Um, so that's like two to three months of strategizing how, and like structuring the company, how we would operate, how we will market, and how we will do our soft launch. And like I said, since we followed the timeline to the T, we were on time to do our soft launch by late January. And within weeks, we already landed a couple of clients. Yeah. So, I mean, a, a lot to unpack there, Joan. Um, and, and I think that there's something in the beauty of like how simply you put all of that out because for you, it's like a known quantity, right? Like, okay, well, this is how I approach it. I build the operation. I define the responsibilities. I build the Gantt charts. I build the dependencies. I understand yeah. what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly how you're wide. And to, to, to be fair as well, I think like the DNA of our business is we're all very much into planning and structure and order. And I think a lot of the, the culture that we've built, um, it's funny, we just brought on, uh, a new uh, team member into the recruitment mm -hmm. team. And she's very much, she's a behavioral psychologist. And she was talking about the fact when she met everyone, she's like, everyone's J's um, in the 16 personalities, <laughs> which is, which is judging versus intuitive. And in inside of J's, it's people who are very orderly, very structured and calculated. And, and so it's sort of permeated through the whole organization, but to, to take it a step back. So, you know, we're talking about three months of building out the, the framework and the operation. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, uh, for you, that's like, yeah, we built it in three months. Firstly, I would say that most entrepreneurs most, yeah. spend three minutes, let alone three months building the operational plan and to really think about it from a, a scale perspective. So, you know, I can distinctly remember when we were building out this framework, we would sit together for hours from sort of the strategy planning and we'd work with mind mapping tools and we'd really clearly define what is the action, what needs to happen from this handoff to the next. How do we do this if we have a hundred clients, a thousand clients? We really looked at the equation not to simply bring on one recruiter and then you know that it's recruiter would scale. deliver. Yeah, so I think that there's a lot in there's a lot in that planning component that for a lot of people looking to build businesses, you know, I also think back as well, the financial model, you know, our goal was in year one to, to have uh, 100 multipliers. And I think we were we had targeted to hit about a million dollars in our first year of revenue. Mm -hmm. And we hit virtually every target that we had set. Yeah. Um, which was kind of uncanny um, considering, you know, when you were going through the experience, you're like, this isn't going to actually, and then, you know, you start to build that 
momentum and then the next positive experience leads to the next client and it leads to bigger clients and so we hit a lot of these planned milestones but mm-hmm. um to, to, to get back over to you Joan so there's been some really interesting evolutions in the yeah. course of the business and I always say that if I was ever to write a book it would be the shit no one told you about when you didn't sign the waiver <laughs> <laughs> because if I had known you know less than two years ago that we'd have 130, 140 uh, employees and that we'd have, you know, 60, 70 live clients right now, plus another business in Escala, plus other clients and the personnel that exists inside of that business, you know, I would have, um, I would have probably thought through things a little differently as well. Like Mm. what is it to have a team of four, you can get to them um, versus, you know, we've got senior management now, we've got middle yeah. management, we've got team leads, like it's become a, a, a fairly sophisticated operation. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'd love you to talk through, cause you were really the architect behind our organizational strategy and planning in the early stages in particular on who we needed and how we needed and what that looked like. I mean, I'd love to hear from your perspective, like, how how do you or how does someone approach building out that model to know who they need and sort of what's some of the logic that you put into your work and you know we just had some other conversations that we'll jump into a bit later but i'll leave it there before i ask you too many questions <laughs> yep so uh, like you said we did have our um like strategy strategic planning when we first started and um like all that sessions that we we poured in like, hours of review and planning to make sure like we, we know who we want to be and um, what will be our, our DNA. Um, and that was basically the, that was the, the reference on how I planned the, the structure for us. Like, since we're starting out, we had to be as lean as possible, but um, lean with multi, like people, we, we look for the, the profile of people like us. Like that's why we call our, the staff that we assign to clients multipliers. So we basically look for clones. So the, the first few people that we've um, hired are, are hybrids because we were still so small, but we needed, we had a lot of grounds, ground to cover. So we focus on the essential staff first um, so that we could sustain the growth. Like the, the first couple of people that we would need to survive would be sourcing specialists, the, the recruiters. Um, and so we didn't have, we, we didn't completed every every aspect of the documentation on, on how to go about the, the operations first. So it's like by face. So we started with um, the, your, your planning uh, for sales and strategy and then recruitment and then hired for recruitment. And then as soon as that has been going, we, we have clients, of course it takes time to source. Uh, we, we finished all the, all the needed um, processes for operations, for onboarding and then account management. So it was all through faces so that we could um, kind of like MVP. So we, we theorize, we put it out, um, we keep on reviewing evaluating and then um, iterations of changes until we know that this is what we did and we, we had that luxury because we did um, we did a soft launch before we knew like we, we we were ready and by the time we did soft launch we already have about uh, after the soft launch about four or five people um, and it was so early but we invested in a data analyst because we know we we needed that information. We wanted to be um, a company that uh, is data driven in our approach and our decisions. And, and that proved a really good investment. Yeah. So I want to dig into that one as well. And I think that's something that, you know, when you talk about what's really under the hood and what's happening and when we onboard people, you know, and this isn't yep. to, to, to pump our tires up, a lot of the time you'll have people join and think that, yeah, this is a startup, but we run more like an enterprise operation today than mm-hmm. we would a startup for anyone looking in. So before we talk about uh, the business analyst and the, you know, the data analyst and the business analyst team that we have internally outside of our consulting business, you talked about some really interesting things that I think a lot of businesses go through in their early stages and things that will work up until a certain point 
but are effectively no longer relevant later on in, in a business as you become more established, you become more professional, you become more defined and things are documented. Yeah. So we were aggressive in bringing on people that were very much at the start attached to revenue generation. So yeah. our initial strategy was how do we bring people that are going to be able to place talent quicker? So we hired you know, more relative senior, but generalists in the recruitment function that they could handle sourcing and interviewing and recruiting. Yeah. And that was, uh, yep. exactly, ha ha be really good for a client um, relations and could actually have those conversations and be a, a great representation. And they were more, you know, they were more sort of Swiss army knife type yes. characters. Mm -hmm. And even on the multiply me side when i'm well i don't wear the sales hat so much anymore but when i'm wearing that sales hat and you, you're sort of explaining to people the iteration you know we deal with a lot of businesses that are more well established than they realize they are and they're still trying to live in in the past effectively of how do i squeeze every penny to place mm -hmm. a massive generalist into doing 10 different tasks yeah. and being a jack of all trades and a master of none so just want to iterate that or reiterate rather that when when we were building the business we had people that are a little bit more general but they still played in their specialized function so there was no recruiters that were delivering marketing uh deliverables yeah. <laughs> you know we we sort of focused on how do we how do we and like for any startup how do we get our proof of concept how do we prove mm -hmm. that growth out and we worked really hard as well on well, what's our key differentiator and that was our onboarding, our processes on how we actually vet and source talent, the benefit structures that we built out. I think that that was probably one of the biggest components of how we attracted, you know, some of the best talent yeah. in the Philippines is that we invested in how do we, how do we create our value proposition as a business? But as we moved into sort of the next stage and you started touching on it, one of our first uh, you know, one of our earlier hires, probably in the first 10 people that we hired was a data analyst. Uh, yeah. And so I'd love to hear, and, you know, it's happened a few times, you know, when we, when we effectively started <laughs> Escala, um, I interviewed our principal, our now principal consultant. I said, listen, she's not going to be a project manager in our marketing team. That's for sure not, but we're definitely going to, we're definitely going to hire her because she's a star. I just don't know yeah. what to do with her. And so I said, Joan, you've got to interview her. And on the back of that, we, you know, the wheels started churning and all of a sudden we have Escala now and that's become, you know, a super yeah. exciting business. So yeah. the when same we thing started, happened. Yeah. Go, go like our core for, yeah. Sorry. Uh, when we started our core focus really was just staffing solution, but out of need and that's our client's need that is, we saw the value of a separate service of providing a fo focused uh, process improvement consultancy to support the growth of our clients. But of course, like we have to um, we have to test it out first and then come ping. <laughs> so we hired her as our eternal bis um, business consultant. So what she did was, even if we're still very new, we we really were very invested in making sure that our processes are always relevant and um, we're very efficient. So like that was our first role and that was our first case study before we launched a second business in a span of like six months. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's a really good point. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you're listening in here and you're hearing us talk for the first time about these topics sort of candidly with each other uh, about sort of reminiscing of the early days here, process was always at the core of the business. Everything that we do has been around how do we actually do this at scale? How do we build a system that's going to really work for us and not one that we're going to work for? And so, you know, I'd say that those are two very early distinctions in the business inside of the first six months of it that most people would only look at six, you know, maybe even years, if ever, into placing mm -hmm. them in the business. And these were things that we felt very strongly about. So another thing happened before we jump into a scala. Another thing happened, like we were saying, where oh, yeah. they actually interviewed uh, Jab, who's our uh, data analyst and internal business consultant. He now has a team working with him. But Joan 
uh, sat and had a chat with him and she campaigned for the second time saying, we need him. We need this. We need this guy. He's got to come into our business. And I said, listen, I trust your judgment. Um, let's go for it. But talk me through a little bit as to the early stages of what that meant, what that's unlocked. Yeah. I mean, what does that do for a business going through hyper growth, if you will? Uh, how does that how does that impact for anyone who might be listening in? So I, I think like one other um, common misconception for, for small businesses is that there's no need for data, uh, data repository if you're too small or, or you're too um, it's really early on in the business, but that's not true. Like you can start gathering data as soon as you, as like second, third month, because that is your history. Like that's where um, data doesn't lie. Like that will tell the story of your growth, your victory and your losses, where like the viruses will tell the truth on where you're not um, really good at, like what you need to, stre- to strengthen further, what you need to improve and correct. And so uh, a quick segue, both Ping and Jab are uh, data analysts, actually applied for the same role, project manager for, for um, Biani. But then after interviewing them, we, we saw them on different roles, like both very vital to the business. And, and so now they're both uh, rock stars in our organization. Um, and so instead of putting them on um, like a project manager role, like job, um, I talked to him and asked him if he would be, um, he would consider a different role instead. And of course, like that's also a part of his um, his forte as well, like da- data analysis. And he has ever since he had been very um, very vital in making sure like we capture all the information, um, like the decisions that we would have in the business. Um, come from data and not just gut feel. And now he's working on bigger and better things, making decision dashboards for us and um, looking into ways on how we would uh, work smarter in terms of um, automation and better workflows. So, so I'm actually going to dive in there. And like I said, the whole nature of this episode is I really want to give people an insight as to what it is or what the experience has been like for us as a business growing up you know we're still young but the way we run Mm -hmm. is is a little different and so what jab has actually effectively helped build and create for us is you know we like joan said we've been tracking data from virtually day one we knew that at at the forefront you need to understand the information and track it so that you can make informed decisions if you don't have that level of understanding, then everything becomes gut feel. And, you know, you end up deep making massive deviations in terms of the business. You know, when we look back at the business model canvas that was presented, there's literally language that we took from it last month that was better than sometimes how we articulate the solution today, which is really cool to see because Mm -hmm. it is so aligned with what we're trying to create here. And uh, it's on almost every presentation we send out, but, um, The quote that we all love internally by Abraham Lincoln is, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening my ax. And so I can't stress that enough for anyone going through this process of business building, evolving, acquiring, selling, any aspect of it, it's all in the planning. So taking it back to the point, what Jab has effectively built out for us with our directive is we have integrated our recruitment CRM So our uh, ATS, our uh, applicant tracking system, HubSpot, which is, you know, a very well-known CRM, of course, and Xero into these Power BI and Google Data Studios uh, dashboards where we understand where things sit. You know, are we stuck in areas of sourcing? What is the true cost and impact to business if we're not moving things into the next stage? How do we solve those issues? What is our financial tracking look like what's our profit and loss look like we, we literally get this data spat out every single day how much cash is in the bank what um aspects that relate to client churn or attrition rates for talent we are tracking absolutely everything 
And as a result, we already have now, I mean, we've only been open for business for about 16, 17 months, which isn't a very long time, but we've been around for about two years when you think about the level of planning that went into it. And I'd say without that planning, there's no way in hell we'd be where we are today in terms of the number of jobs that we've been able to yeah. facilitate and create and the number of people and clients that we service too. I mean, we've just we've been able to touch a whole lot more lives and impact a lot more businesses as a result, purely based on that planning. So coming back to coming back to Jab, I think these are some of the key insights that are really just not shared uh, or not really talked about inside of businesses um, all that frequently, unless they sort of hinge on that on that side of the, uh, you know, if you're talking about more financially backed businesses or financially focused, like let's talk about, I always mention his name and I, and I love the guy, I really should reach out to him, but uh, Tyler Jeffcoats, seller accountant, like I'm sure if you looked inside of their business, they'd have a lot of this stuff baked in mm -hmm. and built out because that's how they're, that's how they'd be wired. Um, and when we work with some of our, you know, some of the aggregators that we work with, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into it before they start putting pen to paper and building everything out. It's a, it's very, very structured. So mm -hmm. I've gone on a lot about it, but it's just because I feel very strongly about the fact that people need to be paying more attention as to things that are happening inside of their business. And, and I'll say, and I'd love you to talk a little bit about this because you were instrumental in implementing it. But I think one of the things that happened probably about six months into the business was that, you know, we went from four to 20 to 50 to, 80 yeah. to you know i mean there's a lot of growth there and we started having these different layers of management and we caught wind of eos uh traction mm -hmm. uh yeah. getting a grip on your business by gino wickman and i was fortunate to have the uh visionary who uh superseded him i think is how you say that um uh by yeah. the by the name of um uh, peyton um so uh mike peyton great guy and walk through sort of the EOS process, but EOS is the entrepreneurial operating system. It's effectively a baseline framework to help entrepreneurs run their business more effectively. And it gives them a set of tools in the business. But I mean, we've been running on EOS now for about a year. And while it's not the be all and end all for how we run our business, it's a subset of you were instrumental in bringing it together. You handled the strategy planning, you handled the implementation. We self implemented and, I mean, talk me through what it was like to get, I don't know how many people, probably probably 40 internally at the time. Um, how did you help build the buy-in, the delivery, uh, and, and where we sit today? Uh, sure, yep. I think um, that would be like one of the fundamental shifts that we had in the business, that caused the change in our leadership approach and our methodology as the team was growing. So aside from just like the three of us managing everything in the organization, we've hired more hungry, foolish monsters to join our leadership team to head to different departments. Um, so we introduced traction uh, EOS to them as well, which we use um, and base majority of our strategic planning um, on the different aspects of the business. So following uh, but the, the EOS model in terms of the, the planning for the people component, process, data, our delivery and reporting structures, and of course, the, the financials. So we did that, I think, um, like last quarter of uh, 2020. Um, and I, like upon reading traction, of course, like I feel like that was that was like the, the moment that we could incorporate a review of sorts about like, uh, our journey so far, and then have that refocus on um, where we're moving the business to in the next year to come. And so uh, that's what we did. I planned a five day uh, workshop. Actually, it's not just, um, it's not just us um, like making the decisions on what's going to happen, but it's it was a learning experience for everyone who joined. Um, and so those are the, the three of us, uh, the department heads, and even a few uh, of the of the team members were asked to join um, so that they would have a voice 
um, and us doing the 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 strategic planning or the all the decisions that we wanted to to happen um, this year. Um, and so, uh, aside from like working on, I, I think what we did was it was just the three of us first, because of course, like direction comes from the top. We built out the organizational goals first, and then that's what we have given them um, on day one to review along with all the data that we've captured um, to show our, our wins and losses for the whole um, like six months that we've been operational. So, so I, I want to dive into that, Joan, because I know I, I say it to you a lot, you undersell yourself, but you're definitely underselling the amount of work and how comprehensive this week was. Because it, for me, who was, uh, you know, I wouldn't call myself a passenger, but I did not put in the level of work even remotely close to what you did to build out the planning, the presentation, the way that ran. So for those listening in, I mean, it was an incredible uh, week of, it was broken up into morning and afternoon sessions. We spent sort of five hours a day for the course of this week running through everything. Joan prepared the entire financials and performance over the course of the previous year. Uh, we, we walked through and we explained to everything, to everyone, every aspect of the business we gave for anyone who wanted to be a part of this planning and strategy week. They were welcome to it. They had to read uh, traction. They had to have an understanding of what this would actually look like. And we built our core values, Lippy, Joan, and myself. We'd walked through it with our good friend, Christy, over at Sunken Stone. Uh, she, she sat down with us and, and, and helped sort of uh, hammer in how we approach it. But going through that week, I mean, it was extremely illuminating. We we, I mean, the way you broke it down, the first was how do we give people the high level insights as to what's mm -hmm. happening in the business? And then you, you built this tiered approach where effectively we understood, well, what are our goals? What are we trying to achieve over the next 12 months? And we broke that or you broke that up into different departments. So you built these cross-functional teams where people would have a discussion for account management and recruitment and finance and sales and marketing and operations. I mean, each department was broken out and teams were sent off to effectively work together to work on this presentation deck that you'd, you'd, you'd sort of constructed and explained. And so we went through this whole thing and I'm just explaining to you how I experienced it because I'm sure it feels very different when you're sort of going through this planning and someone on the receiving end of sort of running through it. But it was so structured because we we looked at what our goals were and then we would talk we would we were shown how do we actually work backwards to say well what does that look like from a financial perspective what does that look like from a personnel perspective who do we need in order to achieve it so joan had these very comprehensive excel docs that would help count out each of the man hours required for capacity planning and you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're sitting here laughing, but like for people who who don't operate this way and operate the way we do, I mean, some of this stuff would be relatively groundbreaking to them because there's no, nothing's happening by accident when you have someone running operations like you do, you know, everything is so well planned out. I mean, you know, when we talk about the different financial modelings, we're always trying to evolve and iterate and and look at how do we create value? That's, you know, mm -hmm. I would say that's our fundamental driving uh, focus as a business is not how do we take money and provide service it's how do we add value and so if things aren't working or adding value we want to hear about it we want to evolve we want to change and so Joan's working on a project right now where we're looking at other service delivery models that might make sense for the clients we serve today and the ones that we're you know we will serve in the future how do we add more value and so this planning week that was run facilitated created by Joan really enabled us to unlock well what does the business look like 12 months from now, 18 months from now, 24 months from now, you know, who do we need? What's it going to look like and how are we going to work through it? So I've gone on a bit of a rant here, Joan, as I am very uh, famous for internally, but <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, that could be a whole nother session. We could talk about that, um, but maybe better offline. Um, lots of other factors that you touch on inside of the business, outside of sort of this EOS uh, planning component. 
I mean, what are some of the other aspects in your, in your mind that people may not be cognizant of in terms of like what it is to go through stages of, of a business growth that, you know, you believe add, add value or things that people, and I feel like even asking you this question, you, you just assume everyone knows everything. Like you're like, oh, well, that's so easy. But um, I'm sure there's a few nuggets of insights that you'd have. So like coming from our, our business, of course, like staffing solution, the things that is very vital is um, for, for companies or owner to realize that when you hire people, you don't just hire for scale, you also hire for their values, and their, their culture. Um, they won't thrive if they're not uh, a culture fit. Um, that's one. And then uh, of course, like, the, the businesses like when you're so small like like us um it needs to be a learning experience so as, as leaders it, it would be up to us to actually mentor the the people that we have even even if they are department heads like we have to teach them like how we want to work or how we want to see uh like progress and results and so that's why uh, even our like the way we plan, uh, the approach is always a learning experience. So it's less frustrating for both parties. You know what to expect. You give um, the clear direction on what the goals and objectives and everything that you ask the person to do. And then yeah, clear instructions. Uh, and then of course, like be there to support and like, that's what we do here in Multiply Me. And uh, like, that's very evident with like, how we plan things and even on how we onboard uh, people. So Yanni, you mentioned earlier that like, we did uh, just onboard a new, uh, re- a new person in the recruitment team. And uh, we really take our time. Like I, we need her to start working like right away, but we're not like that. Uh, we really invest on the people that they get the proper training, the proper immersion um, and everything, like aspect of, of familiar, familiarity with the, the processes. Like every company has their own way of doing things. And that's very important for a newcomer to, to learn off and get the, the hang of. Um, and so aside from um, the training sessions to walk through shadow, shadowing sessions, um, we make sure like, there's documentation support. Um, like we have one-on-ones to, to, to check in with them. And for uh, certain levels, so for our department heads, for example, we even introduce like, uh, that learning session we had on the strat planning is now part of our onboarding so that they really would be empowered. So let's work for us leaders because they could decide from, for themselves. So like they could uh, like at any point in time, like fight for this and say, like, I need this, or this is what needs to happen instead of us just uh, directing and giving the orders, let them grow. And yeah, like by giving them all the, the, the information and letting them learn. So like, that's like our, our difference. Joan, I mean, I was just sitting here. You probably saw just me nodding along the whole time. Um, and it, it honestly it would have been such a huge missed opportunity to share one of the most critical and one of the driving forces behind what I believe is our continued success as a, as an operation is exactly all those things that you talk about. And these are the things that not only do we double down on inside of the operation, but this is multiply me as a service delivery model is based on, on that baseline. So, you know, when, when I mentioned earlier on that we're run more like an enterprise operation, you know, as it compares to closer to a startup, it's because of all of this documentation, when someone joins multiply me or a Scala, there's a two week onboarding plan, you know, we're a small company, right? But there's a two week onboarding plan that they go through where they understand who are the key stakeholders, who's their line manager and who are they reporting into? What does the organizational structure look like? Who do they have to go to if they need help for specific areas? What's the knowledge base? What does that look like? Where can I go and learn about aspects of the company? So creating those levels of, you know, um, 
streamline information and access, you know, what it does is it enables you to really invest in your personnel. And so I'd say for anyone listening in, going through sort of the recruitment process themselves. And one thing that, to be quite frank, when we talk about working as Multiply Me as a, as a staffing a recruitment and an HR function into the Philippines, we invest more in the, the personality and the people and the are they a right culture fit than we would does their skill match one-to-one on paper. And having the right attitude and having the right person who's looking for growth and you, you mentioned before hungry foolish monsters that's one of our five core values in the business you know where the where the breeding ground to create the future leaders of tomorrow in in this ecosystem that we're looking to create we want to invest in our people and we want to have them become into we want to promote internally i mean that's also one of our driving forces behind it is if we can get people who truly understand the business six months in 12 months in they're going to do a much better job than having to bring someone external in and and learn from day one and try and get a handle and manage a new team you know it's a much harder task so the setting of goals and expectations managing of kpis you know giving people and it's not it's not even about like i'm your manager this is the expectation these are the kpis it's a two-way street so you have to look at it from the perspective of everyone inherently most 99 percent of people they want to do well they want to succeed in yeah. whatever it is they do no one's coming in going down the long-winded interview process only to say forget this i'm throwing it out the window you know you've got to believe that everyone wants to be in there and doing a great job and enjoying their work output so setting goals and kpis and expectations and handling performance management it helps set the tone for sort of the mutual contract that you and your team member or your manager or your employee, whatever the relationship is. If you guys can agree and set the foundation, it comes back to the whole notion of planning. If you can plan and agree on what does this look like together, then as a result, that there's going to be smaller gaps in the knowledge base. There's going to be smaller gaps in you know the relationship. There's going to be just smaller deviations. And mm-hmm. so fundamental, absolutely fundamental. And I'm so glad that you did bring that up, Joan, because if you're not investing into your planning around what does the company look like, what does our service delivery model look like, who are the people that I need to come to, you end up finding yourself jumping back into the business time and time again. You know, if we had to every time we onboarded a new recruit, a uh, new recruiter or a new consultant, just to give you guys perspective, we've got over 10 full-time recruiters in our business. You know, we've been around for 16, 17 months in terms of hiring recruiters. So, you know, we're talking about nearly one every other month or one a month. If you look at our consulting practice, we've got over 20 management consultants inside of a year. That's on average, you know, we're looking at nearly two a month every month. So if Lippy and Ping and our senior consultants had to dive in every single time, there'd be almost no ability to produce work output and work output at the level that we're delivering it. So again, all of this onboarding, planning, integration, knowledge base, all these things that you invest in that feel like additional work, you reap the benefits of it, yeah. you know, in perpetuity for the lifetime of your business. So, so, true. so yeah, just, uh, just glad that you, you touched on that. Uh, on that function. I'm trying to think of some of the other exciting things that are going on inside of the business. I'd say that, you know, one of the exciting things that we're working on right now, that's a little behind closed doors. And it's just because we haven't had an iteration yet. We haven't even got a name of what the product will look like, but, but uh, Joan's also been very central to uh, what we've been calling our client portal inside of multiply me. And that is something that for us was built out of necessity. So yeah. we looked at all the HRISs, human resource information systems, and uh, everything that relates to ongoing performance management and how do you build more effective, dispersed, offshore, um, you know, uh, global teams. How do you manage them better? And we haven't seen anything that really hits the mark of the things that we're looking for. And so, I mean, I'd love, I'd love to hear what your, your take is on our 
you know, for lack of a better name right now, our client portal, you know, what, yeah. what's, what that has been like and, and, uh, and what that even looks like. Uh, yeah, sure. It, like you said, Yoni, um, that was right on the ball. Uh, so that was a product of need. So I think uh, our maxim here in the, in the company is like, we are not just a service. We're here to add value. And so um, that was like the next evolution uh, we, for um, an improved client experience for us to make it easier for our clients to get all the information that they need and anything, everything that they need uh, would be in one place. So we had worked on the initial like, design and the idea of having um, a one-stop shop for clients to log in. Um, and like approved leaves, like to manage people um, the on their own, like especially with our setup uh, with virtual workers, right? So they could manage um, manage approvals. Uh, they could provide performance management because like, that's one of the things we're really pushing for, making sure that everyone knows they're standing all the time. Of course, like uh, for 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 people to keep working better they need the validation that they're doing good or if not then they are, their areas for improvement because everyone wants to strive hard and want to show what their their value is what they're made of um, so that's all going to be in one place including um, like invoices for example so it's it's an easier you don't have to rummage in your email to uh, to find the latest invoice, for example, or the latest update on what's new in the company, um, or what topics we have available in our Wolfpack learning program, or you, that clients might want to push uh, for their multipliers to to join. So yeah, so so I mean, you've listed a, a bunch of the functions and the the benefits attached to them, and I think that that's also a big core evolution of our business too is that we again it's all about value creation we didn't see the solution so we've got full stack developers front end back end ux ui designers yeah. technical project managers i mean we have a whole function in the business dedicated to this this rollout and the objective here and i think one of the really important things to remember is that it's not just about you as a manager i think that we really need to shift this notion or this thought process. And also even I'd take it even further. You know, I, I mean, Joan, you know how I am about the whole notion about, I hate the term VAs and I even don't like the term offshore staff um, to be totally <laughs> frank with you. Like for me, when I look at it, it doesn't really matter where you sit in the world, whether you're in the Philippines, I sit in Israel, you know, US, wherever, Australia, it's kind of irrelevant. At the end of the day, it's all about work output and how can we actually do things that you know all that stuff is a little bit redundant but i think one of the really important things to to note as well as a as an owner of a business as a you know as a senior team member it's not just about how do i get out of the team what i want it's they also need to understand as well where do they sit in the opportunity you know we're living in an age you know let's take the amazon ecosystem for a second we're living in an age where there's massive talent scarcity. And so it's not just about, great, this person can do my PPC management. They've done it at another agency for three years. Off we go. It's what opportunities am I going to afford this human being who is excited about their growth and their opportunity and their potential and where they can get to? How can I better service them so that they can live up to their potential? Yes, I get the most out of the input and the investment, but I need that. I need that 360 feedback. I need that understanding of where they sit. And so, you know, we're leveraging existing methodologies and deep, deep learning around leadership. And, you know, we we're talking yesterday about the nine box matrix and um, I forget the leadership. Um, I forget what it was. Situational few, leadership. Yes. Situational leadership. You know, a lot of the things that we're going to look to integrate and implement will take, very established methodologies and inputs so that you know we can have uh, effective e effective growth from the team member that exists in the company and also the the management it's got to be looked at as how do we as a team win not what how do i get out 
as much how do i squeeze yeah exactly how do i squeeze every uh you know every ounce of juice out of this team member that's not the that's not the mindset that we live in and and to be uh, really honest as well we really promote like rostered days off or taking time away from the office you know some of my biggest fears are are my team going to work themselves to death uh if i if i'm honest that seems to be a um a cultural a filipino cultural thing where people will just keep taking on more and more work without actually opening their mouth so if you're working with the philippines please make sure you check in on your team and you actually have regular understandings and check-ins and 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 just realize that uh they'll absolutely die working with you from a cultural perspective just you've got to sometimes look after them yeah just thinking about it i think i'm the best example for that um because like when we were working back at the amazon company a different role but then if you were um a diminisher type of client of client or or manager instead of a multiplier type of manager you wouldn't be able to um unlock my potential and this is like give me the chance to prove myself and so i'd just be a project manager now think about it yeah um <laughs> uh, well i'm glad to hear that and uh, you know and i and i know I mean it was very evident to me what your potential was and is and how far you know you've taken us as a business and where we're going but th- I think that that's so important as well and you know to go back to um to go back to traction for a second there's uh GWC gets it wants it and capable is how you effectively look at where people sit inside of the company so you know we have people often move around internally because they're really really good they they want it they're capable you know what not the best example they get it they want it but they might not be capable to deliver like if you put me in an ops management seat sure i get it you know do i want it absolutely i would love to be able to do that am i capable hell no that's not uh, <laughs> that's not my that is not my strength and so I think that you know in terms of management and strategy you also have to put people in the right seats to enable them yeah. to unlock their potential and to really have uh, success baked in to to them because again we want to succeed we want to do well we want to improve we want to be the best that we possibly can be so um yeah I mean that was just my 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 gut was telling me you are beyond capable you just had to have the right balance of um you know we've had these conversations before but you know it's a very different equation when someone actually listens to you and hears you rather than you know tells you this is how you should run it and this is exactly Commands how you, yeah. exactly and that's not that's not how um that's not how anyone is i can't remember poorly enough i can't remember the core value that we have that relates to that specifically but it's um uh it's it's the notion that it doesn't matter if it's your first day on the job or you're a seasoned uh you know seasoned veteran in the company there should be absolutely you know total humility in your ability to you know yeah. give and receive feedback you you're you're sitting there and you know what it is what's the what's the core value we had like shortened names like servant king and serve serve king and serve yeah i feel like yeah. that's what it was but uh mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I know that we're getting on here and I know how busy you are as a, as a human in our business. So, I mean, Joan, before I let you jump off and get to doing all the things that you do best, um, anything, anything that you feel that we've missed, anything that you were hoping to, to talk about and share? Uh, obviously, no one needs to uh, find out where they can find you. Obviously, they know that it's at Multiply Me, and we don't need to give ourselves any more of a plug here. But uh, yeah, any 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 closing remarks on your end? Um, I think I've covered a lot of things, and so I I'm having a hard time like looking for a parting word. But I, I think if I would have some um it would be about yeah like just reiterating what we have discussed before uh for uh companies that are starting to to grow of course and scale uh make sure to have time to always like step back and review and celebrate your your wins 
um, assess your your losses, and then from there, think uh, like you have to always look back to to look ahead before you look ahead, right? And then like plan your next course of action um, that would yeah like impact, of course, um, not just your your clients but also your your team your your team um, uh, along with your services products and the whole business. So like there's always like that people component that is very integral to the business that yeah like us leaders are the the ones that are um like assigned to look after and nurture love it couldn't couldn't have put it better myself joan i think that it, it really speaks volumes to take that Second, you know, have your strategy week, have the moments in time where you sit back, you reflect, celebrate the wins. Things aren't going to run perfectly day in, day out. They hardly ever do. But when you do have those wins and, you know, just looking back and seeing where you were at, you know, it's about incremental improvements. You're not, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. We're still very early on in this journey. We have a lot to learn. I started the podcast on the sheer desire to learn from great minds and great people and even sitting here talking to you joan and sort of hearing the way you phrase and and look at the the problems that you look to solve you know it's a learning experience for me too so joan thanks so much for taking time out of your very busy day and uh it's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, you're very welcome and again thank you yanni and uh before we leave i remembered it perpetual students so, <laughs> that's it that's it that yeah, is it. it should always be perpetual students stay humble there's always opportunity to learn beautiful thank you john thank you bye bye